think that is a good segue into El Gordo's little topic there. What elements to focus on making a rogue like and why? Because that's not a quick, that's not a long topic at all there. <laughs> but the roguelike genre has exploded. Games like uh, Demon Souls, Buying of Isaac, Spelunky, and FTL kind of led the charge. And now almost every independent developer wants to make their next roguelike-ish or roguelite game. There's a, 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 a topic that doesn't have any debate. What's the difference between a roguelike and a roguelite game? But roguelike design, what drives people to it, has several key factors in my opinion. What makes it or breaks it? The first is that it has to be designed around variance. Meaning, every time I play the game, I should be getting a different experience. It shouldn't just be window dressings that change. This is what kind of hurt uh, Into the Breach for me compared to something like, again, Buying of Isaac. Or something, the difference between a game like Dead Cells versus Bunker Punks. In Bunker Punks, while the levels are procedurally built, they're not creating variants because my options aren't really changing from run to run. In Dead Cells, while it doesn't go as far as I would like, each run is vastly different depending upon what items you find. As for you, for you folks watching this, you, when you watched me play Dead Cells, you know there's a big difference between a run where I use turrets versus grenades, or using the Assassin's Blade versus the uh, Bleeding Blade. And even when we played uh, Cave Blazers, that's another big one that has a huge variance. Uh, I would agree with that, Foreign. A truly great FPS roguelike, roguelike has not been made yet. We tried playing that game. I'm sure you folks will remember this. What was that first person shooter we played that was a procedurally generated roguelike? That you have to pick up the bullets each time you play? It was a neon color? But... Yeah, something like that, like, in terms of getting, like, a roguelike, like, I've said this before, but one of my dream ideas is I want to make heavy bullets, thank you. I would love to design the Dark Souls meets an FPS. You know, have that pacing and that thoughtfulness of, the, of gameplay, but in a first-person shooter. Kind of like the complete antithesis of Doom, which Doom is, you know, balls to the wall, heavy adrenaline play. I want to make like a slow down, methodical shooter. Now, whether there's a market for that remains to be seen. But with a roguelike or roguelite style design, like a first person shooter, you need to be able to have that variance. Like, uh, to give you an example, we played Immortal Redneck and Ziggurat. Or even something like Mother Gunship as well. But the problem is, there's not enough difference in what you're making me do. When we play Buying of Isaac, while the rooms are stitched together, they still afford some elements of difference. Uh, again, when we look at Mark Rocks in the Buying of Isaac, or when there's a random item, but how many roguelike first person shoes have we played that every room just, it exists. It doesn't really affect what I'm doing. It's not really changing the strategy of play compared to something like Dead Cells or The Buying of Isaac or even something like Rogue Legacy. And, uh, oh, here's another good one. When we play the game Flint Hook, that is a really solid Yep, exactly. Yep, and that's true. Uh, I'll get your point in a second, Benjamin, as well. But um, with Flint Hook, the core gameplay loop was solid. I really loved that game from the basic gameplay standpoint. But every run just started to feel exactly the same way that I just got tired of playing it. And again, we've played The Buying of Isaac. I am up to easily like 200 hours of playing that game. I'm sure uh, for Algoro and Foreign, who've played the game as well, I'm sure you're probably pushing equal or more hours of that game of Isaac as well. 
And the thing is, the reason why we play it so much is that we get that different play each time. But with a first person shoot like Mother Gunship, again, oh my god. <laughs> well, um, I shouldn't be saying that. My friend who plays Team Fortress, he is over a thousand hours, and I pushed at least 1,600 hours playing Left 4 Dead 1 and 2 combined. <laughs> We're all addicts here. But yeah, going back to our previous point about the flight sim, yeah, you need to understand if there is a market for it. And that's where playtesting, that's where iteration, that's where refinement come into play. <laughs> I don't think we'll ever find that. <laughs> here's, the, here's the big question though, Gordo. Is that normal of Warframe, or are there people who are even more addicted to it than that? But... Getting back to the topic at hand before my voice dies on me. Mm-hmm. That... Which one is Strafe now? I'm pretty sure I must have played it at some point. Let's see. Oh, I know a good example of one. Ah. So I'm looking at Strafe right now. I'm watching the little video of it. Yeah, I, I'm betting, and that's one of the things about uh, the difference between a roguelike that has abstraction versus or an RPG one and a skill-based one. The problem with skill is that so much of the design is focused on the player that it doesn't really matter what you throw at them. They're just going to be able to get through it all the same. But when you have RPG elements, that changes how you play. With the buying of eyes or even with dead cells, if I pick up an item that, let's say, reverses my attack, or like the broken mirror in the buying of Isaac, that is a huge modifier to how I play the game and changes what I do. But if I just pick up a new weapon in a first person shooter, I'm still shooting. I'm still running back and forth and shooting my gun. How is that changing what I'm doing? Yeah, and that's also not good as well, Forn. That the level design has to be playable. Um, for those of you who watched me when I played A Valley Without Win, for instance, those uh, room designs are just awful. And it's the difference between something like A Valley Without Win and Spelunky. Spelunky, every level is designed that it is beatable, and you can get through it, like, realistically, I should say. And it still looks almost handmade, and that's a brilliant part of that game. Now, another aspect of a good roguelike is that it has to... I don't know how to phrase this. It has to kind of soften the blow of dying in the sense that the player should feel like the run was beatable and they should feel like it's their fault for losing. We have played, and I'm sure for everyone watching this, you can think of examples of roguelikes where you've played them and it just feels like you couldn't have done anything to get through it. You know, like you load it up, then they spawn immediately an elite enemy, you die. Or you load it up, and you never find any ammo or new weapons, so you're start with your basic weapon, and you die. And this is what killed me when I played um, Teleglitch. That your starting weapon is so weak and crappy that you have to rely on getting higher tier weapons, but if they don't drop or you can't find ammo, then it's like, how was I supposed to win? And before I'll go to types in the chat, again, this is why I hate the phrase, losing is fun. Because losing is fun doesn't matter if there was nothing I could have done to avoid it. This is one of the things that kind of annoyed me about FTL, and I think it's a serious complaint about Dead Cells. That the fixed bosses kind of get in the way of random progression. Because let's say I get to a boss, like the Hand of the King, and... I have nothing I can use to beat the him. Then I lose. What could I have done differently? Loot Rascals, thank you. That's another really good example. 
Lewd Rascals is so focused on the abstraction that I can't make the best out of a bad situation. If higher quality items don't drop, I can't win. There is no amount of skill, there's no amount of player mastery that I can achieve that will compensate. But again, going back to something like Enter the Gungeon and the Buying of Isaac, and this is what we were talking about on stream when we were discussing Enter the Gungeon's design. At the high level of play of Enter the Gungeon, it is about you. You can make lemons out of lemonade in Enter the Gungeon and have a serious attempt at playing it. No gun in Enter the Gungeon is going to supplement your skill or replace it. Now, of course, when we're talking about beating bullet hell and all the craziness, yes, you do have some RNG factoring in. But, at the end of the day, a good roguelike should allow me to allow my own skill to be the win. And yes, playing the Bind of Isaac, and you guys have seen this, when we have a bad run in Buying of Isaac, it slows things down. When we don't get any attack ups, it becomes a slow play. But I can still win that way. If given enough time, I can make that run turn out to be a win. It may take me an hour to an hour and a half of play, but if I want to play that run, I can, skill, I can still get a W in the win column. But when you play a roguelike where it basically says, if you don't get this, this, and this, you will never win. And that is another big point. If you're going to have persistence, the run should still, every run should be winnable to some extent. We were talking about this many times over, and this is one of the things I didn't like about Rogue Legacy as well, and that in Celebration of Violence, that you can't win on your first run because the abstraction is holding you back. You need to level up your persistence systems. You need to have a higher attack. When we were playing that uh, Dungeon game on stream as well, that's another key point. That when the abstraction and the persistence is so extreme that you have to have losing runs before you have your real attempt, what's the point of playing? If I have to play your game 15 times before I can even take a shot at my winning run, what was the point of those 15 plays to begin with? There isn't one. And you have to be really careful with how you balance persistent elements. I think Dead Cells and The Buying of Isaac are really good on that front. In Dead Cells, you can reasonably win on your first run because it's so player focused. Probably you're not because you don't know how to play the game, but there's nothing inherently saying, oh, you must get your weapon damage modifier to level 5 in order to beat the Hand of the King. So, I hope you can grind those cells out. And even something like FTL, the persistence of FTL is very light in that regard, but it then focuses on RNG. But, uh, I want to go back to that point about RPG elements, what Bifrost said. Because, again, I think that's a major element. The RPG elements are what swings the scales of balance wildly. And you have to accommodate or be willing to allow your game to get crazy like that. And I think that's another big point of some of the popular roguelikes. You can't design your roguelike for 100% balance. It's just impossible because you never know what the player is going to get or should be able to get. So that's why you want to have those crazy elements. Uh-oh. Alright. Yeah, the, well, there's a spoiler. Uh, for people watching this record, be sure to join our Discord where we'll uh, rain on your parade about Dead Cells. It's linked down below. But, that's a major point about a good roguelike. That you have to allow for craziness. Again, with the buying of Isaac and Enter the Gungeon, we, again, for us who have played that game... We have seen those insane runs. Buying of Isaac, when I get Brimstone meets uh, the homing shot, meets the try shot, meets uh, Mega Saiyan as um No, not Mega Saiyan. Uh, Mega Fetus. And then it's just basically, walk in a room, everybody dies. Boss dies in one second. 
And there's no way of balancing that. Edmund McMillan is never going to sit there and go, well, maybe I should tone down Brimstone then because it's too good. No, he's not going to do that. And that's the beauty of roguelikes with those extremes. You can have a run be just a, you know, skin of your teeth close run. You didn't realize you were going to even win this. You know, you pulled it out the 11th hour. We've all had that run, the Bind of Isaac, where we win with half a heart of health left. But then on the other hand, you can have those runs where it is so easy, it's just like, I don't even need to play the game. Like, I could give this build to someone who has never played Bind of Isaac, and they will still beat the game due to how overpowered it is. But the point is, your design has to be open to those extremes. You need to have those game-changing items. It's kind of like the difference between throwing like a pebble in a pond and throwing you know, a giant boulder in there. The pebble is going to make very little waves, and the boulder is just going to splash all over the place. But you need to be able to have those extremes. And even with something like Dwarf Fortress, or going back to games built on that kind of procedural design, they allow you to have completely different runs. Sometimes you may have, you know, everything works well. Or you may just have a series of unfortunate events, and it just goes bad to worse. Like what we saw with RimWorld as well. But the point is, it has to be open to everything. And that requires a very explicit design, and it also requires you to develop a very well thought out algorithm for how procedural generation works. And again, going back to Spelunky, yep, exactly, Foreign. I'll, I want to elaborate on that in a second, but with something like Spelunky, Derek Yu talked extensively about the algorithm he designed for that game, and he wanted to allow it to be open enough so that a lot of crazy stuff can happen, but it's still constricting enough that he has or the computer has control over that experience. And another good example of a game that failed was that... Oh, crap. Again, we've played so many roguelikes, I've lost all the names of it. That uh, Toxic Waste one, where you mutated different forms that it felt like if I didn't get the right upgrade, I wasn't going to win. But going back to Foreign's point there, the amount of work that's going to Isaac is very unassuming. Is so much of that has been the supplemental content under the surface with additional room modifiers, enemies, the secrets, bosses, stuff that you really wouldn't see if you were just staring at a screenshot. And while it may not be a roguelike, I also really enjoy the work that Firaxis has done with XCOM and XCOM 2. And the supplemental content they have done is amazing. And I keep saying that, and I'm going to keep saying it, but I would love to get Jake Solomon on for a cast. That will be a five hour cast, folks. And I'm starting to uh, fall out right now. We're at an hour, almost an hour and a half in of streaming, but I would probably just never stop talking to him. Because I would just have so many questions about that game. But the idea is that so much of the work that goes into a successful world, I think this will be our stop point in hell. I think we may have three different topics I can cut into videos here. But the success of a roguelike, a lot of it has to go with what's under the surface. But you still need to think about how someone's going to walk into that game for the first time. One of the things I think kind of hurts Dungeons of Dread more on repeated plays is just how... I don't know the term I want to use here. How, like, fiddly it is upon first look in terms of what you want to do. And that... Here's my official last point, because then I really have to go get something to eat, because I'm starting to uh, die here. But so many roguelikes, and even RPGs, front load all their decisions into the game, and that just becomes overwhelming for new players. While the best ones I've played, they take those additional elements and they seed it into the under into the uh, uh, foundation of the game that you find out more of it as you play. The buying of Isaac, you find those new items and abilities that get added to your routine, but the game doesn't hit you with all that. Like 
Imagine, for instance, I know I'm starting to ramble here. Imagine if the buying of Isaac, instead of you picking up your items as you played, you pick your build. Let's say you pick five power-ups every time you start playing that game. And you're having to choose five more. And then there's a hundred choices. And then two hundred. And then three hundred. It will just become overwhelming. And it will also slow things down. But... I really do need to get going because both my voice and my blood sugar are starting to drop here. So I'm going to wrap things up here. But here's my question for you. And we'll probably take this to Discord. And for those of you watching this recorded, let me know as well. What other aspects do you think makes or breaks a roguelike or roguelite style game? And again, to summarize, we've talked about variants. We've talked about... Being able to design a winnable element for the player. And we've talked about having that depth uh, under the service that keeps people coming back to it. One of the games that I played that I didn't like was... Oh, crap. Here's a question. Here's a bit of a challenge. What was that game we played from Harebrained Schemes? Where you had to go into that reverse pyramid. And again, one of the things I just didn't like about that game was... It just felt like too much of it was out of my control. But what are some other elements that we didn't talk about that you think do deserve to be part of successful roguelikes? Let us know in the comments or head into our Discord. But thank you so much for watching this week's Game Wisdom Live. Next week we will hopefully have Rob back on for it. And if you're new, be sure to check out our Discord channel, again, link down below. And if you like access to these talks ad-free and uncut, check out patreon.com slash gwbicer to get VIP access. We'll be back later tonight for our Salt and Sanctuary play, hopefully after I've become well-rested and well-fed. But until then, have a great Sunday afternoon, or whenever if you're watching this recorded. Take care, everybody.